What's up, guys? Welcome to another exciting video on Bible Dingers. And on this one, we have a relevant conversation on what's going on in New Zealand right now. So we mostly talk about theology on this channel, sometimes some apologetics. But we've also done a few videos where we speak about some political or social issues. And that's what we're going to be tackling today because we have some good friends from our bar network that are going to be joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and bring them on here. Andre and Matthew, what's going on, guys? How you doing? Hey, Ryan. Great to be with you. Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you guys so much for being on the show. So I was stoked whenever Dwayne announced you guys in our little uh, bar network chat because, well, firstly, I've never met anybody from New Zealand. And so that automatically makes you guys like the most interesting people in the network. But besides that, I know you guys have uh, some really cool ministries, Free to Be Church being one of them, and then also the podcast, No Lasting City. And that's really where our, uh, that's really where our friendship and relationship started is within the network because you guys have No Lasting City and we have our podcast within the network. But I've been seeing all kinds of crazy uh, headlines about what's going on down in Australia and New Zealand, uh, mostly about COVID restrictions and lockdowns and things like that. I see pictures of camps and, and all kinds of crazy stuff that we're dealing with maybe on a much smaller scale here in the States. And so I really wanted to bring you guys on to know what, what's going on down there if you can give us sort of an insider view so what what is like can you give me an overview of some of the restrictions uh down there in new zealand yeah uh ryan thanks so much for having us just just so you know uh i am uh born uh in australia was born in australia uh a new zealand citizen now been here for for eight years uh andre uh at, when you when your listeners hear him speak, they'll, they'll hear his beautiful South African accent. Andre's been in New Zealand for, for some time now, faithful pastor. We know the context here very well. Um, and then also with our connections with other nations, particularly Australia and South Africa, who are going through similar things, we can hopefully give you a, uh, an accurate representation. I do know that sometimes things get blown out of proportion or maybe not reported accurately, both in the mainstream media as well as on social media. So um, we can we can help uh, your listeners and yourself uh, give you um, on the ground clarity. Um, but Andre, why don't you begin um, with just giving a snapshot? Hmm. Well, let me start by saying that New Zealand um, is one of the most beautiful countries in the world. We love living here. Um, everything you saw on the Lord of the Rings, um, the beautiful nature is exactly what New Zealand looks like. But right now it feels like Mordor down here um, <laughs> because of all the chaos around us. Um, in the sense we, especially obviously for the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in New Zealand, we, we are experiencing extreme restrictions to, to worshipping together. Um, the numbers are regulated by the government, um, which makes it extremely difficult, obviously, for us to function as, as biblical churches. So, um, so that's where our great concern really lies. We, we do feel, obviously do feel for our fellow citizens who are also under, under um, uh, vaccine mandates. Um, they created a two-tier society, those who are vaccinated and those who are not vaccinated. An unvaccinated person cannot, cannot go and sit inside a restaurant to eat while all the vaccinated um, may. Um, so, so that's been a... Uh, a shocking development, actually, in a country like New Zealand. That um, that's a country that always proud themselves because they are a nation that uh, that functions under Western Western civilization rules. And um, so it's all it's all been quite shocking how quickly things have turned from um, from 2019 to where we are now. Probably one of the most um, difficult countries to live in when it comes to restrictions um, and mandates being opposed, um, imposed on us. Yeah, and it was somewhat unique in the sense of um, 
New Zealand has traveled its own path in the sense that we did have about an 18 month period. I think it was about 18 months. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that long, but where we were inside our nation functioning as we normally would uh, with no restrictions outside of the border. And that's because they really locked it down being an Island. They can protect it from, from the cases coming in. Um, so, so there is this mindset where, you know, we are somewhat unique and, and yet, as the rest of the world is getting on with things now, uh, New Zealand is certainly uh, not getting on with things. Uh, as Andre said, there, there is the whole vaccine mandate thing. And I think, I think for people, they, people either run immediately to this being a health issue, uh, which it certainly is, or they run to it first being a moral issue. And we kind of run first to what are the moral gospel implications and then the health things, not, not at the expense of the health. It's a very real uh, virus. But we're put in a position, you know, speaking as a church, where if we say uh, no to a healthy person who has not partaken of the medical procedure, if we say no to them being allowed to come into church, then we're allowed to meet in uh, with no restrictions, unfettered freedom, uh, in many ways, just like a pre-COVID day. Exactly, really. And yeah. um, because we can't do that, and why, the reason we can't do that is because in the gospel, God accepts both the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. So uh, we, we're we not going to say to uh, one person who wants to come and receive of Christ and his benefits on the Lord's day, no, you may not enter. Well, because we don't opt into the state obligation to do the vaccine passports, we're punished. Um, we're punished with very severe uh, gathering restrictions, and um, and that's an unfortunate thing that we're facing each and every Lord's Day. But there's so much more we can talk about. But that's just a bit of an introduction. So you guys have vaccine passports for restaurants and for is it churches or is it just any social gatherings in general with like a certain amount of people? Yeah. So a good way to think of it, and I don't think that a lot of people, and it only kind of struck me the other day. Any event, so they define event or gathering, any event is off limits to an unvaccinated person, which is quite amazing when you think about it. Think about how many events there are. Um, <laughs> an, an event cannot be attended by an unvaccinated person. If, an, if a single unvaccinated person attends that event, it immediately goes down to significant restrictions. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. The government initiated a two class. Well, it's a two class discrimination. Our own prime minister said that there's two classes of people now in New Zealand, like straight up, like mm. unapologetically said it. And um, uh, they instituted a traffic light system, red, amber, or orange, or, or green. And um, and when we're in the orange setting, which is what we've been in for the most time, uh, it is. 50 for a mix of unvaccinated and vaccinated people. But for vaccinated people, it is literally unlimited. Now, we've moved down into the red setting uh, because of the arrival of Omicron uh, variant on our shores. And so that is um, 25 if there's an unvaccinated person present in a gathering uh, and then 100 everywhere else. And so... It's just a remarkable way to 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 be to be to be living, and um, and 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 sadly, uh, I think because it comes under the guise of health, there's a lot of Christians that the 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 penny hasn't dropped or the light hasn't gone on that we're living in an oppressive uh, society at present. So I just want to make sure I understand the rule. Is it so? It's any event where there's 25 or more people. There has to be COVID passports presented. No, any event, have... full stop. Mm -hmm. No, no, any event, full stop. So think of an event like a like a theater event, um, like a, like a function, um, uh, conferences, conferences, anything like that. If there's an unvaccinated person present, then the whole thing shuts down to either twenty five or fifty. But if it's only vaccinated people, it's unlimited. Or in this red setting, one hundred. 
So that obviously, you know, with churches, <clears throat> but I mean, most most churches will obviously have vaccinated and vaccinated people in their membership. So, so that automatically means that all churches are not allowed to have more than 25 people in a gathering under the red light system. Now, some churches are actually are actually obeying the government's rules um, and they are preventing unvaccinated people to be worshiping together with vaccinated people. And that's, you know, that, that, that really breaks my heart because that is clear discrimination, even within a congregation, but this is what's happening. And, and um, um, we're trying to say that, no, we need to uphold that, which the Bible so clearly teaches us that we are all welcomed in Christ Jesus and that, and that the church's doors should be open. And like Matt says, you know, yeah, okay, it is a real virus. Um, some people are at higher risk than others, but that's a personal decision that people should make. It should not be a mandate from the government to tell the church how many people should be able to come and worship or not, or to discriminate between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. So most churches are affected um, because of these uh, these regulations. And we're, we're somewhat... Um, churches that are not opting into the state obligation of vaccine passports, we're sadly seemingly in the minority. Um, what's amazing, Ryan, is I lived in America, um, lived in America, and uh, one of my children was born there, and I have many friends in your wonderful country from all over. And when they hear about what's going on, and people from other countries as well, when they hear about what's going on in Australia and New Zealand, they just... Uh, the, the mind is boggled but you talk to the average kiwi around here and it's just like yeah it is what it is it's you know they can't see it and, it, and that's the part that kind of um astonishes me yeah it is because i i i'm still trying to understand the event thing it's like that seems so there, there's no like parameters around it there's no is is am I right in thinking that there's no it's just events there's no like specific events basically the entire thing is and the government and ministry of health self profess that the whole thing is to drive up vaccination rates right they know that people will want to go to events and so they they purposely do it to to drive up vaccination rates you know one of the things we're trying to highlight to to our people is and this is what's happening we, we've been noticing it happening in in nations all around the world and again sadly if people just have as their diet nightly news um they're only hearing one well it's clearly a skewed view um alarmist view bent view narrative view um we're trying to help our people see that uh the vaccine doesn't stop transmission and even in this latest round where we're trying to you know, free to be church is really um, trying to stand for the church to be able to be open. Um, the, you know, there's been events all around our nation just recently. It's because it's summer here, right? And so there's music festivals, thousands, eight thousand people um, gathering over the weekend, singing, dancing, and um, cases are just spreading out from those vaccinated um, only events, hmm. right? got friends over in New South Wales and Australia, Victoria, all over the place. Same deal. So it, it, you can only say so much and, and then in time people will see this for what it is. But yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm lucky enough to not live in, in New York City. I live right outside of New York City. Um, but for people who live in New York City, there's a tracking system for the vaccine cards. You have to upload it. And it's called uh, the key to NYC. Do you guys have a tracking system as well in New Zealand, or is it city by city? Yeah, we've got we've got um, a QR code that you have to scan whenever you whenever you enter any building. Um, funny enough, we have we have friends who visited the northernest most part of New Zealand, and there's a, a there's a lighthouse there. Right at the top, no one lives there. It's just a just a place people go to make sure you see the uh, the end top of New Zealand. And lo and behold, outside there's a QR code for you to scan to show you that you were there. So, so that's how ridiculous it is. But everywhere you go, you need to scan in. If you don't have the the uh, the QR scanning app, you have to sign in. 
Um, so yeah, tracking is a real is a real thing. And and some places there are actually security guards standing at the door making sure people do scan in or sign in. Um, mm -hmm. The vaccine passes come into play when, for example, you want to go in, into a restaurant. Um, they will ask you at the door, do you have a vaccine pass? If you don't have, they won't serve you. Some places, not even for fast food. They won't even bring the food out for you to be, to be able to enjoy it outside. You cannot sit outside at tables. So they would check you, and that's also on your phone. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty Orwellian if you think about it. And, Ryan, um, this is not the United States of New Zealand. The, the, there's one state. You know, this is the, this yeah, is in many it. ways, you know, yeah. it's the Democratic People's Republic of New Zealand. Hmm. So uh, my follow-up question has to do with, um, I, I don't want to put you guys on the spot. And, you know, if, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to. Are you guys comfortable with sharing your status or will that get you in trouble if you put it out there on YouTube? Like our, our vaccine status? Yeah. We're, we're, all, we're all good, man. We, we, we can make it clear that um, Free to Be Church uh, cares little to nothing whether you're vaccinated or not. Um, if, if someone wants to get the vaccine, go for your life. Um, as a pastor, I've walked with people hand in hand to go and get their vaccine. Um, I've also, like Andre, ministered to people who don't want to get it, who've suffered job loss, because that's a reality that's played out here. People have lost their jobs and are losing their jobs weekly. I just talking to a guy yesterday who got to help him here. He's lost his job and other people will lose their jobs. Um, so we are, we are not anti the COVID vaccine. We are anti the mandates that are a two class discrimination system. Um, mm. And, uh, and so um, I, I freely um, uh, chose not to partake of the, the vaccine as a matter of principle, as well as a matter of just personal sovereignty and, and, and my own decisions. Uh, other people on my staff here, the staff here at the church have, um, have chosen uh, to get it. And, and that's wonderful. That's great. All the best. And we all stand together uh, against the, uh, the mandates. So I wanted to know about essentially if if you don't have it, what does life look like now? Like, are you just not going to things, and just going home and going to work, and that's your life now, or what is it like? I appreciate the question because I know Ryan. I grew up in a city as well. Andre, did you grow up in a city or no? Yeah, Pretoria. Yeah, Pretoria. We know what it's like growing up, and I've never been in New York, but I grew up in Melbourne. You know, these are these are. We grew up with cafes and grew up with all restaurants and grew up with all this stuff, and so I, I know I know the context from which you asked that question. But um, man, it, it you just life changes immediately. Um, I used to love taking my kids, you know, Saturday morning or whatever to get like a little kids cappuccino and and, and whatever else, and with my wife, you know, bacon and eggs and this kind of thing. Well, that hasn't happened for the longest time since December third when the, when it came in. Um, I trained jiu-jitsu for eight years. I can no longer train jiu-jitsu. And, um, yeah, life certainly changes. Date nights are a little different, Andre, and got to get a little bit more crafty about those. And picnics are one thing, and just be nice to sit down in a restaurant with your wife and whatever else. Yeah. But, you know, people have lost jobs over this. And, and so so to not be able to go to a cafe when people are losing, you know, they've worked for 15, 20 years in a job, you know, that that's far more um, significant. Yeah, absolutely. We were in the States. They were trying to mandate it federally that you had to be vaccinated or you had to keep track. If you were a company of 100 or more people, you had to keep track of your employees vaccination status and they would penalize companies if they had unvaccinated workers. That thankfully got struck down. And so that's not the case anymore. Do you guys have an employer mandate? in new zealand we have only with two um two well three industries really uh the medical medical all medical personnel had to be vaccinated twice um and then all who work in schools so all teachers and um support staff in schools and then all those who work at the border 
so they were forced to take the vaccine. Um, but what happened is because because of the um, or the constant fear mongering and the pressure that the government puts upon um, businesses, even um, many businesses have have asked their people to be vaccinated. So even though it's not law by by government decree, companies have made it law within within their employment. So so um, if you work in retail, for example. Uh, depending on where you work, the company might just tell you, you have to be vaccinated or you cannot work here. So it filtered through the whole of society. You cannot go anywhere where this is not a discussion. It's just everywhere. Hmm. Yeah, and that's true. And and um, personally speaking for my life, I'm also not vaccinated. And I don't I don't live in New York City, like I said, but I go to church there. And they're much more strict than New Jersey, where I live. And so prior to all the mandates and things, we'd go to church in the city, go out to eat with friends, you know, do things with our church family. And that just doesn't exist anymore. We we go from our house to church and then we some, we'll have to pack a lunch a lot of times because sometimes, you know, you guys are preachers. Sometimes you like to go over a little bit. And so sometimes we even pack our lunch so that we can eat on the way back home to New Jersey. Mm. And so it is crazy just how life changes in an instant because of these laws. We were supposed uh, we were supposed to have a our biannual church camp um, in of February. Had to cancel that. We had to cancel youth camps, which we've run since 2020. Every year had to be canceled. Um, since since August, we only were able to serve the Lord's Supper communion twice. Um, so, yeah, every aspect of church life being together has been affected by these things. And and then there's the pastoral issues. You know, like like what you rightly said, we have people on the one side who is extremely pro vaccine and and pro, um, let me say. Um, following government regulations to the T. And then you have on the other side, people who are, who are anti-COVID vaccine. And they say, you know, let's just go on and, and do what we please. And they're all in our church. So as mm. pastors to be able to, um, to minister to both and keep that unity that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is extremely challenging because you also have your own personal views that you constantly have to bite your tongue, not to make, um, not to cause more division from the front, from the pulpit. So keeping keeping the sovereignty um, of the local church in the aspects or the or the sphere of authority that the Lord has given us, the mandate to minister to our people um, and to and to show that Jesus Christ is Lord over the church. I think those those aspects has been just constantly in the front of our minds. How do we minister to the people, showing them? that the church has the Lord Jesus Christ as his, as her head, and we need to submit to him first and foremost, even long before we start thinking about how we can fall under the regulations that the government gives. And then to find creative ways in order for us to keep on doing what we know we should be doing. Um, it might mean one church would meet outside. We are meeting outside right now. We cannot even use our own, uh, well, the building, because we meet in a school hall, so we cannot meet inside. So we have gazebos and marquees up and, and running away from the rain and then coming back. That's how we do it now. So you have to try to be creative, but hold to those core things that the people of God needs to meet. The means of grace need to be administered. Pastoral care need to be given. Um, and the fellowship of the saints need to be encouraged. Amen. You know, there's, there's um, just picking up from what Andre said, this church is from the top of the North Island to the bottom of the South Island, meeting in barns, um, meeting on other churches' property, uh, meeting outside because they're choosing not to segregate two healthy people. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite an incredible uh, time to be alive. It, it, it is an adventure, but it is a draining, heartaching time. You know, Andre mentions the, 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 the juxtaposition between the two different views. There's, there's obviously all the views in between that um, and trying to graciously shepherd the people while posturing 
as Andre said, the lordship of Jesus Christ over his church. Sphere sovereignty has been something that we've, we've, we've pushed strongly. I mean, you think about it, in May 9th, uh, sorry, in, 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 um, in December 2019, we hadn't plumbed the depths of Romans 13 and Romans 14 like the church three, 400 years ago uh, had to. Um, I know some wonderful churches around the world who, who were very uh, astute theologically, and they hadn't. They hadn't had to wrestle with those things, but praise God, he brought, um, you know, whether in their pastor's mind or sometimes they might have a number of staff or whatever, and they plumbed the depths of that. And it was able to help them lead their church through things, um, sphere sovereignty and, and a number of other things. Um, of what we've really been trying to put in our people's minds, because here in the West, a little bit different in America, um, but but here here in the West, you know, for three, four hundred years, there's been just this, uh, the government and the church have relatively been uh, at peace with one another. And there hasn't been overreach, the spheres reaching into each other unnecessarily. Obviously, they do intersect both the family, the church and the government intersect at certain points. But um, unbiblical overreach, it, it means that there's been, you know, this great earned capital between the government and the believer. And so when these things start happening, it's really confusing to the Christian to know how to think. And we've had to wrestle with those things. And we're just trying to shepherd people towards those those things. But unfortunately, um, you, you can't always get there with people. And, um, and we're just trying to love on people. You know, if people stay away from our church. If people want to want to meet in homes and jump on the live stream, that is uh, fine. We love them. Uh, we want to, we want to serve them and 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 we want to embrace them. Uh, and yet we want to remain the posture, remain in the posture of uh, assembling, uh, because that is what the Lord calls us to do, and He's most worthy of our worship. So I wanted to ask about your church gatherings um, that you mentioned. Are they have these restrictions? Um, if there is sort of a commingling between vaccinated and unvaccinated. So does the government know because you guys also have to put one of those QR codes at your church? Like my question really is how, how would they even know? Are they keeping track of churches and what's going on in them? I mean, well, they probably are, <laughs> but who knows? Um, but in, in, in the sense of, um, you know, they, it's a little bit like what plays out in Canada. You see it move. It's like a playbook, you know, where, where the government has this, their, their arm, the police, and then it moves from the police enforcing things to health officers. Um, we now have that. that. That wasn't always the case here. Uh, but as we've moved into, you know, we're just playing catch up in many ways. W there is now health officers who who will enforce those things. And so breaches will be reported. Health officers will chat to them. You know, we've, we've got businesses in our community that are facing those things. And um, so, yeah, it's it's not it's not so much that you need to be registered. Uh, you know, they, they just they just issue their decrees, their mandates. And then, um, yeah. Hmm. I think it's also, you know, what, what we're doing, Ryan, is we're trying, we're trying for the sake of the church and for the sake of our neighbors in New Zealand. And, you know, we try to, we try to keep to the regulations as much as we can. So we're not, we're not running around with pitchforks saying, you know, um, we want to overthrow the government. That's absolutely not what we want to do. So what we do is we listen, we listen to, um, to what the newest regulation might be. And they change seriously. They change every week. Um, but we know what we need to do. So we know we need to meet. We know, you know, all those things that I mentioned before. So right now, what we do as a church, we have groups of 25. So you can be a gathering of 25 people. And if you're outside, you can, you can separate one group from another group by two meters. Then they are two separate groups and that's, and that's allowed. So we have, we have these gazebos that we put up and underneath one gazebo is a group of say 25 and then the next group and next group and next group. So we have our church is spread out like that during the service, which we, we, we now say to the church officially, the gathering starts the moment 
we say this is the call to worship. That's when our gatherings start. What happened before that is up to the individual. They can mingle as they do in the malls and wherever they are. The moment it starts, we are doing what the government says we should do. We separate. The moment we say amen, again, we say the gathering is over. So the church, the, the actual gathering of the church is over. Now people can again do whatever they want. So, mm. so we're trying, but we use every single loophole legally that we can in order for us to be able to meet. But another issue that comes into play then is to understand those people who do not want to be in that meeting because of the fear mongering that they've been exposed to. Um, I've, got, I've got people even, even in my own church that I haven't seen for four months. I haven't seen them um, even in some of our, our, our Zoom meetings where you can see other faces. Um, so how do you even get to those people? You know, how can you minister to them properly? So it's a mess really for the church. And I think that's the important thing is we have decided as, as, as free to be church um, members, board members, but also the wider, true, really strong Christian churches here. We are not going to give in on, on those essential things that we need to do that we need to do, that the Lord commanded us to do. Um, however they look, maybe we need to change certain things, how we serve the Lord's Supper, we had to change that. Um, but that's okay, as long as we do what we need to do. That's what we mm. hold on to. Yeah, amen, amen. We have a property here with multiple venues and buildings, and so we live stream into there. People gather all over the place. Um, we've met outside as well. And so we're, you, just, you just try and make... Uh, do with what with what you can, all while maintaining um, everything that Andre just uh, described there. Mm. So that leads us into what I'm curious about next, and that's your organization, Free to Be Church. So can you tell me a little bit about what it is and what you guys do? Um, so Free to Be Church, we're uh, we have a board of about eight. Eight men, um, pastors, all of them from various churches, cross the nominational, um, but men of the word. And we've had such a lovely fellowship together since this all started, just throwing things to and throw, having theological discussions. And it's been it's been great. But anyway, the, the idea for Free to Be Church was um, New Zealand's legal system works like this. So we have the queen is the head of the state and she's in England. And then she appoints um, the Attorney General within New Zealand. Um, and then we have a parliament, and the parliament are the elected members of members of parliament. So right now we have a Labour government, and they have a majority within parliament. Now, parliament has sovereignty over, over lawmaking. So um, whatever the parliament decides becomes law. Now, when you have a majority government, that's uh, well it's kind of dangerous because whatever laws they want to bring forward will be voted in um and they've gone this is why i jokingly refer to it as the democratic people's republic of New Zealand. <laughs> yeah so um so the only way for us to be able to um um to test whether the government has has overreached their powers in lawmaking um, is for us to actually make a legal case against them on the basis of the uh, the Bill of Rights. So for Americans, New Zealand doesn't have a constitution. Um, that makes it really difficult because in America you can you can go to a constitutional court and you can test it in the Supreme Court on the basis of the constitution. New Zealand we cannot do that. We have a Bill of Rights, which which means almost next to nothing right now, as we can see. Um, freedom of religion is protected under the Bill of Rights. That's not been upheld. Um, the freedom of choice or assembly, all those things have been denied to most citizens in New Zealand. So, so what we wanted to do is to see if we can gather enough people to make a case against the government and test in court whether their actions um, um, were legal and, and actually just to ask the court to... Um, to help the government to see that religious freedom is not is not something that they can just chuck under the bus. It's something that's been protected historically. Our history of New Zealand is very closely linked to England, obviously. Um, so English law has been protecting these rights 
um, we came in contact with Christian Concern. It's an organization back in, back in England. Um, they do legal cases constantly um, on behalf of Christians in England. And um, they just won a case a year ago in Scotland on the same basis where, where they went to the court and, um, and the court decided on behalf of the churches that the government has no right to tell the church that she close their doors. Um, so we lean, uh, lean very heavily on their expertise as well. So right now we're in the process of getting all the material ready. Probably in this week or next week, we hope to, to actually lodge the case and ask for a trial. Mm. It's quite, quite amazing. Scotland was the first nation to go, if you will, in the sense that, um, yeah, they, they won their case. And that then triggered Wales and England. And so, um, you know, we don't put our hope in, in, in the courtroom. We, we put our hope in God, who is our shield, uh, Psalm 7. Um, and yet, if New Zealand is going to um, reject our case, it's knowingly going to go against multiple international law breaches, as well as Scotland, England and Wales. So um, God has just blessed us uh, with some wise heads, um, both from the UK and here in New Zealand. And so um, one of the things that's remarkable to me as I think about tracking with the guys in Canada and all that happened at Grace Community Church in Los Angeles and other places is that um, so far uh, governments have not been willing to have uh, the evidence for their uh, measures tested in court. Um, with Pastor James Coates, they adjourned, adjourned, adjourned and didn't allow it to happen. With Tim Stevens, they didn't allow it to happen. Uh, John MacArthur told me um, a few weeks ago that when uh, they, um, they, they went, Grace Community Church asked for a, um, I forget the word, but they asked for testimony in court uh, by the government uh, and regarding the, the evidence for them holding the view they do, and they settled within 24 hours. One could surmise, they settled outside of court in 24 hours. One could surmise from all of that that um, they know the data doesn't stack up under scrutiny. Um, so pray for Free to Be Church. Uh, the website is freetobechurch.nz. Um, we we have a, a donation page there. We're just trusting the Lord to provide the legal fees. Obviously, they're not um, not cheap, um, but the Lord's providing. And again, as Andre said, there is nothing about this that is seeking to be uh, rebellious. It doesn't come from a rebellious spirit. In fact, we, we want to be those who are marked by being good citizens. I don't know how many times you have to say that and still get criticized for being rebellious. Um it's, it's not about disobeying or defying the government. It's about obeying Christ. Mm. And this is not about vaccine. This is about the lordship of Jesus Christ. So many people think that this is all about health, but there is a list as long as my arm of things that show that this is not about health. Um, it's, it's not about health. Um, and so pray for us. And, uh, yeah, we'd love to see... You know, regardless, if the court throws it out, we'll keep doing what we're doing because Christ is worthy. But we're just trying to, you know, um, make an appeal the right way. Sadly, in recent weeks and months, <clears throat> we've seen, haven't we, Andre, just glaring uh, inconsistencies presented in other court cases regarding whatever they may be. And the judges just throw it out and throw it out and they keep keep throwing it out, even though there's glaring inconsistencies and, and contradictions in the argument. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just want to, um, yeah, Ryan, the, uh, the court case that we mentioned in Scotland, uh, we talked to one of the, one of the plaintiffs the other day and, and he said, one of the beauties of that court case is uh, the lawyer that defended them walked up, um, in trial and he said the first words his opening statement was your honor these men are here because they believe that jesus christ is lord over the church mm. uh, my hair stand up just saying that because yeah. um, that needs to be established in every aspect of our lives and and why not also in court why not why not say to the government that jesus christ is lord i listened i listened to another podcast the other day and um 
a great man, Scott Brown, and uh, and he was he was interviewing someone, and and this person said, "We believe in the separation of church and state, but he said we don't believe in the separation of Christ and state. Jesus mm. is still Lord over the state, and we as the church have a." a prophetic, literally proclaiming the lordship and kingship of our savior, Jesus Christ. We have that mm. prophetic ministry and it doesn't end at the, at the doors of my congregation. It goes beyond that to my neighbors as we do evangelism to the man in the street, to the woman on the sports field. But it also goes into our parliament buildings called the beehive. <laughs> it needs to enter into the beehive so that our prime minister and our, our MPs would know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he's a Lord who is sovereign and he needs to be he needs to be obeyed. Now, we don't expect everyone, um, you know, we're not we're not wanting to establish a theonomy, but. But we want Christ to be known by our MPs and we want them to know that the church has Jesus Christ as their head. Hmm. So good. I mean, I, I think, you know, Andre mentioned that Free to Be Church comes from cross-denomination. Andre and I have different views eschatologically. And um, one you know, of us I would is be correct, a, the other one not, but we won't <laughs> And some, some, some of the other brothers are some of the other brothers are, are post-millennial, and so they have a more, you know, we would say rosy view of things. Mm. Pre-millennialists can be too pessimistic. I think we can all bless one another by by steadying one another out. But you know, I, I'd take the view in the sense that we don't kind of win down here, um, but just be just because we don't. Um, sorry, someone's calling me. You good? You guys can still see me. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, um, good. Just because we don't win down here, according to our, our view, doesn't mean that he's not worthy of upholding, uh, and that, and that's what we're just trying to do uh, mm. here. Yeah. So you're you're preparing to present in courts. Here in the near future, what is the, in a perfect world, what is the ideal outcome? The government says to the church, we trust you to be able to provide um, uh, gatherings that, um, that are uh, not wholesale reckless, and yet we leave that to you. Um, because uh, we, in many ways, believe that you are essential. Mm. Yeah, um, and it has to do with the sovereignty, the sovereignty of the church over the church's affairs. Yeah. So, so we want to establish that the government has no right to tell a church how a church should meet, when they should meet, how many people should meet. Um, so it is the sovereignty of the church to be church. So are and, you guys, uh, mm -hmm. and in many sorry, ways, sorry, I was just going to say, in, in many ways, you kind of have two hills presented before us right now. We're talking to our people. I know the other guys are talking to their people and you have like, so the conversion therapy bill law is about to be passed as well as a hate speech law. So that's one hill. And then on the other hill, you have the, the vaccine parts system uh, where we're punished for not opting in and therefore, you know, our gathering restrictions are limited even though clearly the vaccinated only events are spreading COVID uh, mm. everywhere. Um, you have two hills that people are willing to die on. Well, well we're willing to say, Hey, uh, we, we agree with you here. And this may be your exit point in terms of, you know, standing up. We're here. I really think those two hills are going to merge real soon. <laughs> and um, it presents its own, own problems, but um the, the ideal outcome would be that, uh, you know, I, I look around the other nations and um, a lot of the mandates stay, but the church becomes exempt from them. Um, the mandates in society are still wrong. Um, there is a civil sphere and then there is an ecclesiastical sphere. We're talking about the ecclesiastical sphere. We're very narrow in our focus. And um, that would be the ideal outcome. Hmm. So how can people support you guys, especially like for me, I'm not anywhere near New Zealand. I don't really have a say in what goes on there. So how could I, and to be honest, like 98% of our audience is here in the States. So how could anybody in our audience support you guys through this? 
I think for I sure, think pray. I'm... Amen. For sure, Amen. pray, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah, you know, we do. We do believe that if if um, if we obey the Lord, um, John John fourteen tells us, you know, we um, we can ask the Lord anything and. Anything there means anything pertaining to his kingdom and his will in his name. So I do pray and and ask your audience if they would remember to pray for us in New Zealand. Pray for pray for a good witness um, and that that witness will be will be true, not a superficial love that the world is is trying to force upon us. Because that's one of the arguments they say, if you love your neighbor, you will get vaccinated. If you love your, well, no, if you love your neighbor, you will love them as Christ loves them. Um, mm. So that's one thing, prayer. Um, if you can spread the news about who we are um, on our website, uh, like Matt already quoted, free to be church.nz, um, all the information is there. We do have a donation page there. And I'm, I've always been extremely... <laughs> skeptic asking for money but um, a court case is quite expensive this is a trial and i believe the new zealand dollar is um is much weaker than the american dollar so so any ten dollars worth of american money will be will be almost twice as good here in new zealand so we Perfect. appreciate that if people would be willing to give towards the cause um and um yeah i think spreading the news let let more people know what's going on in new zealand and pray for our land. Our our national anthem starts with the words "God defend New Zealand." That's that's mm. what it that's what it is. And I pray that God will defend New Zealand. Um, mm. And by by spreading the good news of the gospel to lost souls. Mm. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I wanted to hit on one last thing, and I mentioned it in the beginning. It's a little bit off topic, uh, but this is how I know. Matthew specifically is through the podcast No Lasting City. So for our audience members who haven't heard of it before, can you tell us a little bit about your show? Yeah, yeah, No Lasting City. A couple of us here, a couple of the other pastors got together and we're like, man, we it'd just be great to do a podcast and record stuff during the week um, once a month because I'm going to interrupt immediately now because I'm not I'm not part of that podcast, but let me tell you something about that podcast. It starts with the words, we are the second best podcast in the world. So whoever is the first one, Ryan, you and you and all the others can maybe find that out, all right? But that is a pretty good <laughs> no one. idea. Right? <laughs> this is I can very assure true. you it's not Bible dingers. <laughs> yeah. No Lasting City is probably the second best podcast in the world. Um, that is just a scientific fact. Um, <laughs> the The... We, we resolved at the start that we would meet once, that we would record once a month. Uh, we didn't want to be so burdened by it. Um, but it's been great. Just just some of the contacts we have, um, uh, just just getting guys on and, and trying to bless primarily our people. It's a ministry of our church. We, we, we put the link out into our church email. Um, but, you know, also in in our mind when we're when we're doing this podcast is just to try and think about who who else we could um, bless and so our first episode we got two uh, dear friends um, Dr. Mike Riccardi and Dr. Peter Sammons. Uh, Mike Riccardi is from Jersey uh, originally. Um, nice. Both of those guys are on staff uh, at the Master's Seminary there, and we just spoke about our view of things on, uh, on in the Reformed faith. Um, we then had Steve Lawson. Uh, on talking about R.C. Sproul and preaching. We had Samuel Say from Canada come on and talk about racism and government and education. Then we did an episode um, on uh, regeneration preceding faith, and we called it Make Regeneration Great Again, or First Again, <laughs> rather, Make Regeneration First Again. Um, we had Pastor Mike Abendroth on, a dear friend of ours, just to talk about preaching and making sure we're talking a lot about Jesus in our sermons. We had Tim Stevens on from Canada talking about um, just all that he's faced. Um, I recommend all of those episodes. Um, we had James Dolezal on, uh, Dr. James Dolezal, talk about all that is in God. Uh, and then we've done some other stuff. And so uh, once a month we, we release a podcast. It's been great. No Lasting City podcast. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're thankful to be a part of the the Bar Network, the Biblical and Reform Network, and and uh, thankful for Dwayne and, and, and Ryan, thankful for Bible Dingers. And, uh, and for you having us on today. 
Absolutely, man. And what platforms are you guys on? Yeah, all of them. iTunes, Spotify, and every place uh, where you would listen to a podcast, we're, we're on there as well. If you have awesome. Instagram, you can go to No Lasting City Podcast um, and uh, check us out. Awesome. Listen, guys, it's been illuminating. I, uh, Like I said in the beginning, I, I really didn't know the situation down there, so I appreciate you guys coming on and really explaining it to me. And then uh, explaining what you guys are doing in Free to Be Church. I love what you guys are doing. Support you guys. For anybody watching, I hope that you guys will go and support this ministry. Support our brothers and sisters in New Zealand. Whether it be in prayer, whether it be giving to Free to Be Church. Thank you guys so much for being on the show today, man. It was it was, it was was a lot of fun. Thanks Thank for you, having man. us, Brian. And, and if you or any of your, your listeners want to come visit New Zealand... Just wait this out. Soon the borders will hopefully <laughs> open again, and we'll happy we'll be happy to have you. Absolutely, there's a lot of faithful churches here, uh, mm-hmm. standing true on God's word, and um, there's a lot of faithful believers around this nation, and uh, yeah, it's wonderful. You know, I got to tell you that I'm happy that you guys started with a reference to Lord of the Rings because I know in the majority of my life. Everybody I know, when we think of New Zealand, we think of Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So I didn't want to bring it up because I'm like, oh, they're probably sick of hearing about Lord of the Rings. You know, oh, everybody talks to them about Lord of the Rings. But uh, I'm glad you guys broke the ice on that one. I didn't have to. Other... You can come and visit Hobbiton, brother. You can come and visit Hobbiton. <sighs> Sounds like <laughs> a the dream. Best part, but the best part of New Zealand is not is not the Lord of the Rings, but it's the rugby. The rugby. The rugby, yeah. It's a American a single American, game in my life. It's American football for men. It's really good. <laughs> That's awesome. The All Blacks, straight up, are the most. And I don't even know. I hear Americans say this term, and I hear reporters say this term, winningest. I don't even know if it's in the dictionary yet, but I'll use it. The All most Blacks are the most winningest team in the history of sport. The and All so the Blacks. The number one religion. The number That's one religion. Our That's is, our national. Is, is is rugby um but praise god that there's many people um uh, who worship christ <laughs> <laughs> i heard it was brutal man i heard people are getting like their ears torn off and people are losing consciousness in the middle of the games and stuff is that is that true oh, yeah. yeah it's 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 a hard out game i grew up playing aussie rules which i would say is more it, it's it's more crazy uh, or crazier um, but, um, it's a brutal game. It's like war chess, like this game of just chess. Um, but I tell you, when I was living in America, I walked, I walked the side of the college football games. We got invited down there, me and another guy from the seminary. And after that, I resolved never, ever to, um, speak ill or untoward of American football because, I saw guys get their helmets blown off by being mm-hmm. hit. Some of those guys, I don't know even know the positions, but they're running fast, big athletic sprinters, you know, big guys, and just they spear tackle one another, and it's kind of hectic. Yeah. Oh, we, do, we do that without helmets, so I don't know what, you, what you're on about. <laughs> <laughs> it's good guys, to know that uh, wherever you are in the world, men, we can always we can always agree that we like violence and, and – <laughs> Doing horrible things to each other. <laughs> but the good yeah. thing about it is we can we do it, and then afterwards shake hands and off we go, that's you it. know, and friends. Yeah. So that's all good. <laughs> yeah. That's it, man. Well, listen, guys, I'm gonna let you go. It's dinner time here. What what is it? Lunchtime over there? Yeah, it's like 11 30 a.m. Gotcha. 11 35. Well, listen, guys, I appreciate you being on. It was it was a lot of fun. Thanks, Ryan. we love all the your ministry as well brother yeah we love ryan allen we love bible dingers and uh it's been so great to to come on here thank you very much 